Good morning, everyone. I suggest it's 10.30, we, we start. Um, good morning, everyone in the audience. I understand we are also being streamed online. So good morning, everyone who's watching or listening uh, on their computers. Um, my name is Florian Kreisinger. I'm with Airbus Defense and Space. Um, it's my pleasure this morning to give you a very short intro on the context and the frame of this uh, breakout session, what we're doing today, what we have in mind. And afterwards, I hand over to the panel. Uh, the topic, as you can see, technical dimension of re-aim FCAS as a use case. So I am Airbus Defense and Space, and I'm working with the, the FCAS program for, FCAS, uh, for Airbus Defense and Space. Um, maybe most of you already know what, what FCAS is, Future Combat Air System. It's um, the largest, most ambitious European defense collaboration program, certainly for the next decades, maybe even for the 21st century, and uh, it's going to be more than just a fighter aircraft. So it's going to be an interconnected system of system um, with the ambition to, to connect assets and platforms, but also eventually connect um, the domains to each other. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really a large uh, project ahead of us, and it also underlines the opportunity in the big picture for a more joint, I would say, a more joint and integrated uh, European defense collaboration, defense policy, uh, industrially speaking, but also politically speaking, and um, also with regard, of course, to the military context. Um, FCAS was kicked off in 2017 by Germany and France. In 2019, uh, Sp Spain joined as an equal partner. So it's a tri-national European project at the moment. It's open for further European partners. So it uh, uh, it's, can, be, can be expanded. And the ambition is to have the system fully operational by 2040. So it's a long-term process as, as usual in these programs we're talking about here. And, of course, AI will play a crucial role in a, um, in a program like, like FCAS. Um, right now, we are about to enter the technology uh, demonstration, the technology maturation for the program. So it's the, the right stage to address the, uh, the, the questions we are addressing with you um, today and um, really to, 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 to also introduce the re-aim topic for a FCAS. In fact, that's, that's what we've already done some time ago. In 2019, um, Airbus Defense and Space and Fraunhofer jointly set up um, a working group on the responsible use of AI in AFCAS. Um, what we did basically is, in a, on a much, much smaller scale, what the REAM conference is doing here on a, on a large scale. So we, we are approaching a, a multi-stakeholder um, access uh, in our working group, we have, um, we have academics, we have NGOs, we have ministries, we have engineers, software developers. Um, but we also have stakeholders with a specific non-defense or security background. So we have uh, philosophers, theologists, we have uh, novelists. So it's, a, it's really a, a broad picture we, we brought together and with whom we, we want to, to exchange on the topic of, of re-aim specifically for the FCAS program. Um, the goal, however, is not just to have, a, to have a normative forum, so to discuss these questions theoretically, but in fact to, to jointly develop a simulation tool um, which then illustrates and demonstrates the, um, the opportunities but also the challenges of AI in a system like, in this case, um, FCAS. Um, what information can AI provide in concrete scenarios? Um, what does this mean for the process of, of decision taking? What does this mean for the operational commander and so on and so forth? So these are the, the questions we want to address and we also would like to address and debate today. Um, we are um, just entering this process of really developing the simulation tool. So, um, and uh, you will see in a few minutes the very first glimpse where we are standing with that. But of course, this is work in progress. So we started the, the development of the simulation like a good year ago. So it's really a step-by-step -step approach. So also happy for, for any input or feedback we can receive on this. Um, before I hand over to um, Wolfgang Koch, who's the, uh, from Fraunhofer, the co-founder of the FCAS Forum, 
Uh, let me just briefly introduce to you our panel today. Um, and I start from you on the right, from my side on the, on the left, um, with uh, Anja Dahlmann. Anja is from the Hamburg Institute for Peace Research and Security Studies, and she's the head of the uh, Berlin office of her institute. Then we have uh, from uh, Estonia, Kairi Talve. Uh, she's from the Estonian Defense Ministry and a scientific advisor to the uh, Defense Minister of Estonia. Uh, Tassilo Singer. Tassilo is a lawyer and chapter lead of AI and data with uh, uh, Capgemini. Um, Tom Gross. Tom Gross is my colleague from Airbus Defense and Space, and he's the chief engineer of EFCAS. So he's basically the, the technology link also to the debates we have on a normative uh, level in, in our group otherwise. And uh, finally, uh, general retired Jörg Vollmer. Uh, Jörg Vollmer is the former chief of the German army and commander of the Allied Joint Forces Brunsum, so he has more the operational angle. And having said all that, I hand over to, to Wolfgang Koch from Fraunhofer, uh, who is the moderator of today's session and who will also, to start with, give you a very first glimpse of this um, demonstration tool we are developing at the moment. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Florian. I um, would like to introduce you very shortly into a not completely unrealistic military scenario. Imagine that um, uh, you have to suppress enemy air defense um, of a um, power relay station, which is protected by enemy um, air defense um, uh, batteries. Uh, the enemy wants to bring to other um, batteries of um, SA-22 batteries into, um, into this area. Um, he uses uh, several uh, convoys in order to do so. And um, your job is, our job is, to um, do uh, parts of the target recognition process. Um, for this end, we are using videos collected from um, uh, remote carriers uh, who are observing what's going on in this dynamical scenario. AI helps, AI is useful to detect and classify what's going on, but there is also a need to verify and to understand what AI is actually doing. To this respect, we are using um, recent results from um, research on explainable AI. For example, heat maps. Heat maps um, are um, possibilities to understand what parts of the images are relevant for the AI's decision on what object it might be. Heat maps reveal also give hints where AI might uh, misclassify uh, what's going on. So AI is a necessary tool. AI has also its um, um, deficiencies. And um, perhaps the very notion of um, explainability is a bit overpromising. Um, we cannot transform black holes into white white holes, uh, uh, white boxes, so to say, but at least into gray boxes. And human beings are very good at um, dealing with gray boxes. And so our ethical AI demonstrator has two roles. Firstly, it is a training tool for giving um, the soldiers, um, the air commanders, the possibilities to understand what AI is, why, 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 why we, um, it's necessary to have AI, but also to let uh, them experience the limitations of AI. Um, and secondly, um, our demonstrator is um, good, um, a good experimental system which in a process of interaction reveals what the ethically critical questions are in the targeting cycle, in various phases of the targeting cycle. So our um, um, demonstrator is an ethical requirement um, generator, so to say. That was um, the introduction. Let me um, start um, with a question to you, General Falmer. Um, uh, why is it so necessary to deal with um, AI tools um, in uh, reacting on the threats uh, that um, should be answered by a system uh, such as EFCAS? Because we have to deal with so many informations. We always have to deal with information. However, it's increasing exponentially. And uh, if you take into consideration a fast-flying airplane and uh, a given mission, 
and uh, during this mission approach, always new information are coming in. So the, the danger is that the human being is overwhelmed by the information, and therefore it is necessary uh, to keep him informed with informations which are attributed, assessed, so that he has as good as possible a picture on what's ongoing around him. So this is not only his own position, it is about his wingman, uh, this is about the enemy, this is about the ground forces, this is about the civilians uh, which will be or may be on the ground. So he needs to have this uh, information. In the end, he has to make a decision, and uh, he always has to make a decision. But th the point I'm making is, Everything we can develop which helps him to get a more profound decision uh, is, is, is worth every uh, working hour we are putting into this program. In the end, my message is always the, the, the human makes the decision. Either he is uh, attributing directly and he's pushing the button, or he might be overwhelmed by, by, uh, by, by dangers coming in, airplanes, rockets, whatever, where he is no longer capable to do any single decision on his display uh, by his own. So then, but the human being again, he activates uh, then the defense system and the defense system will help him and uh, the others uh, to, to, uh, to survive and, and to continue with this mission. So from, from, from my perspective, it's very much about uh, information overflow, helping to, to sort out uh, this information overflow to give as much uh, credible information as possible and uh, to give the human being then in the, uh, in the system uh, the decision point uh, where he makes a decision. But not to be mistaken, we will never have 100% information, never ever. So there will always be a point in time where you have to make a decision. Uh, be it on higher levels, because then subordinate commands need time to put it into action, or, or be it on the technical level where you are in permanent uh, contact with the enemy and where you have to make a decision. So in the end, it's a human being. You will never have 100% uh, information. You have to rely on 90%, 85%. But today, these 85% can be better than 10 years ago. So this is my point. And therefore, uh, the AI can help us quite a lot. And, but another point is we need to trust it. So therefore, in this development process, and that's exactly, I think, what we are discussing today, everybody needs to be involved in the system to understand what it can deliver and what it cannot deliver. So it's, it's about trust and confidence, and in the end, do I trust the system or do I not trust the system? But in the end, it falls back to you, the human being, you have to make a decision. What are the challenges for the natural intelligence of um, human soldiers in dealing with these very powerful AI tools? Yeah, yeah first of all, they, they need to understand how they work. Mm -hmm. um, they don't need to understand the algorithm, definitely not. But they need to understand where are the um, things uh, the, the, the AI system cannot deliver. And, and one of the points is what you mentioned, the black hole and the white hole, to turn it into a white box. So that to understand, okay, I will get as, as much gray as, as I can, however, there is a limitation to that. And he needs to work with it on a, during the development phase, but then in practice, on a daily basis, really to be, to, to be used to the system to understand its limitations. And, and, to understand, and that is what I would teach, uh, never completely trust on it. Uh, there's always a certain amount of uh, your own intuition uh, by your practice, by your experience, where you say, okay, now I, I understand it, I have to make a decision, and that's what I have to do it. And, and you can say, no, uh, this is, uh, mm -hmm. I, I look at it from a different angle, and I have to make the decision in a different way. So. Uh, the machine will not decide. It's a human being. Tom, it's your job to transform um, the military requirements into technical requirements and moreover to bring in ethics into the machine. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, thanks, Wolfgang. <clears throat> yeah, that's exactly the, 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 my problem statement, so to say, <laughs> uh, that I need to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I mean, right now we are at an early stage in the project, have conceptual development and also R&T technology development, which I think is the perfect point in time to do such kind of checks and investigations on how to deal with the sub subject. 
So it's for me a lot about stakeholder management. So which are my stakeholders I need to talk to? Not only the potential pilot in the cockpit or whatever operator, wherever he or she is sitting, uh, but also how do I need to involve with the appropriate procurement areas, certification areas, validation areas, uh, and to some extent also the society which drives the political level. All of that will influence to some extent uh, the requirements landscape. Uh, also picking a little bit up what, uh, what General Fulmer was saying, it's for me staggered how do I use artificial intelligence and in relation to that automation, high levels of automation and to some extent maybe also autonomy in the different cycle steps. So how do I deal with it in the information gathering? How do I deal with it in the information aggregation? Then next step, the decision making and last but not least in the tactical execution. Um, or if I transfer it to military terms, the Observe, Orient, Decide, Act, and even the Assess Loop uh, at the end in the, in the engagement layer. So how do I deal with it in that area? And how do I really properly implement a modular design that allows potentially different rules of engagement to be implemented uh, and to deal with the different approaches to the situation? Um, so that's, that's one thing to get there. And I'm seeking for ways of how to have an engineering design approach to cope with that requirements. IEEE 7000, which is one of the papers I'm orienting myself on, uh, value-based engineering ethics by design, is also stating you first need to go into a stakeholder need assessment and out of that basically further propagate your requirements landscape and don't then go into your design process. So that's, that's one part for me how to tackle it. The next one is then really to check what are other AI reference papers to orient on. And I think almost every nation in the meantime has issued some kind of paper that could be used as a guideline. So having a system that needs to certify multiple stakeholders, also single nations, more European and even uh, basically on NATO level to see how to interact. Uh, those are basically the areas influencing the different requirements scheme. So I will have to have a modular setup in design. I will have to have an appropriate design process that deals with it. And also linking with your statement, I need in the way I develop it uh, to have the appropriate, call it authorities, call it validation bodies, certification bodies, with me in the design process, building up that trust and that tool landscape that allows to build that. And then, of course, also in the implementation, uh, not only look at the functional chain that was built, but also in the data landscape that was used to really build it and will be kept using to further implement and mature it. So it's not only modular setup by implementation, it's also modular setup over the whole life cycle uh, to really have the ability to modify, to learn and constantly improve on the setup. So that's the challenge we are facing, but I'm quite confident that if we have the appropriate mindset in talking about it and have the ability to exchange between all of the stakeholders in a reasonably open manner, uh, then we can have a successful uh, storyline there. Tom, you are a member of the FCAS working group on um, technical responsibility for, for FCAS. Uh, and you are, of course, following the activities uh, on, on the ethical AI demonstrator. What are your expectations? For, what do you wish from such a demonstrator? What, what do you want to harvest from us? I'd, I'd really like to make the AI implementation tangible. And then really, as you said in the beginning, what is the concrete ethical aspect, aspect of the specific functional chain we are looking at? Uh, to really derive out of that uh, the requirement on the design that I need to basically to put in place to cope with that, that request. Uh, so far, there are a lot of theoretical discussions, but let's really get to some practical implementation topics discuss them to a certain level of detail that we all have a common understanding what are the challenges we are facing on a day-to-day -day basis with the colleague that is sitting in a cockpit or even with the decision maker that may be sitting on a, on a level higher or even two level higher. And if we can implement that in that kind of uh, demonstrator, then I think we have achieved a lot. Thank you very much. T Tassilo, um, ethics is much more than law, of course. Um, but how are lawyers thinking in transforming military requirements, technical requirements, ethical requirements into regulatory systems. How can this in the end be shaped from a lawyer's perspective? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, well, 
I first have to start with kind of a disclaimer. I want to be precise on what I'm talking about. So are we talking about general AI or are we talking about narrow AI? Because this demonstrator clearly shows a use case. So this is a narrow AI. So we are talking about A and so be precise, a um, AI in a military application for a certain function. In this case, it's object detection. So this is the first stance. So we have to take the context into account if we talk about legal requirements, ethical requirements, and so on. So for what is this tool designed? What functions do we need, do we want, and so on? And so you can imagine in a huge project like FCAS, you have a lot of different AI functions and applications. Let me talk about like IT perspective. These are different programs, maybe linked or not, but you know, it's not the AI, it is different levels of it. So if you talk about um, such functions in the context of targeting, then you have a, a fairly developed legal requirements framework based on Article 36 AP1, um, which basically says legal review, weapons control, in development, and so on, and so on, and so on. So you cannot move beyond that. That's your, your conditions in the Quanon. But also, as we're talking about a very sensitive issue, and this is like AI, in targeting, meaning people can get killed, um, there is the whole collateral damage discussion and so on, we have to be careful and therefore you need to imply ethics, so just as a starting point. But when we are now talking about like how to do this, um, well, we have our different rules, we have distinctions, precautions, proportionality, you all know those rules, they, these are transparent. But how do you get that in a system? And I would say start slowly and think about what exact use case am I talking about? You have a perfect example for this. This is object recognition, object detection. So immediately, as an a, a operational lawyer, um, you talk about distinction. That's the first thing we have to talk about. That means, like, is this a, a regular truck or is it an air defense system? So take this rule and interpret it, evaluate it. What is the purpose of this rule? The rule is that you guarantee that you are only targeting, and be precise on it, targeting only legitimate targets, military targets, military objectives. So that is, that is very important. And then you have to do a very, very hard job. You have to link up with the technological people and say, like, how can I get this requirement as a technical requirement? How can I translate this into a technical requirement? And that's actually the, the hard stuff. I have to look at the uh, exact use case, at the exact rule, um, interp it will find a common ground on the rule and so on. And now, to make it more difficult and complex, you also have to take account ethics. So just give me an example how I could imagine to include an ethical principle in it, because you have to be careful too. There is no one ethic. There are different ethics for different situations. So um, if you consider the ethic um, uh, okay or viable that you're not targeting fleeing soldiers, then define what do you mean by that. That means, for example, that they throw away their weapons. So you could say, from an ethical principle you're integrating in that, that you are designing an object rec um, recognition algorithm that uh, recognizes people throwing away their weapons. And then, in, in such a demonstrator case, the, the, the objective that is recognized by the AI is certainly with an interface or so solution marked. That would be a, a, a thing I could imagine to integrate ethical principles. But that means, to get to a finish, first, next steps should be discuss about the use case and be precise about the use cases. And in a more general way, to find out which ethical principles have to be applied to the specific use case, you need to have a common discussion. And like this whole surrounding is kind of one step in this. And in my position, just in contrast of FCAS project, I think it is very, very important for Europe to develop an own position on this and um, to have a direction, because if we don't, others will make this direction and a decision for us. So we need, need to make this decision, and FCAS is a great chance that great nations like France, Germany, and Spain are coming together, and of course, the Netherlands are are an important part of it, to come together and start this discussion on what ethical principles do we want to have in this delicate environment. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. K Kyrie, you, you are living in a frontline state, so to say. Um, you are coming from, um, from Estonia and working for the Estonian Ministry of Defense. And your country is very brilliant, for example, in countering the, the cyber, cyber defense um, uh, attack. Well, what is the, the role and the importance of AI for you as a, as a small country, uh, as, I, as I must say, with limited resources? Yeah, uh, I would bring firstly the interoperability that uh, uh, as a small country I think uh, we don't define or, or describe the big picture so the main thing that we have to do is uh, to adapt and to find the ways how to how to how to make operation and to uh, how to get the interoperability with our allies and in terms of technological um, advancement and uh, uh, development, we should uh, have forward-looking, innovative and smart uh, mindset and uh, to assess uh, what, what are the key elements that we need to make cooperation and, uh, and um, uh, to, to comply with, with allies and what are, the, uh, what are the main technologies that uh, need to be employed and, and, uh, and what, what kind of military and technological uh, uh, competences we need, what are the critical competences that we need to make this kind of cooperation. And here I, I would come to my second point, which, which is the um, uh, role of humans in this kind of uh, decision-centric or mosaic warfare in the future. And we have to make some decisions here as well, as uh, we know that uh, the pace of the battle is increasing and, the, and is getting more in intensive in terms of AI and autonomous technologies. And this means that uh, it puts a, a lot of uh, load and, uh, and a huge load to humans in cognitive sense. As we saw in today's uh, uh, introductory video in, in, in the morning plenary session that the information is coming from different sources and is coming very quickly and it's really put some some uh, tension to, to people. So it's, it's quite a uh, quite difficult uh, question. And, um, and, that's, uh, and the ability of aggressor states is, uh, it has become so easy to keep up the cyber operations and to, uh, to just to deceive or, or distort the situational picture. And, and humans have to have this ability to uh, to be able to to act in this situation, so I think in, uh, in 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 general we need to think about what kind of soldier we need in the future, and and uh, more broadly we need to make decisions in terms of human resources that uh, who and how much and in what way we train, recruit, and uh, etc. And. Um, and for example, the question that we have now generations uh, entering to the defense forces who are more intuitive and more natural with technologies than the previous uh, generations. And does this make this task easier? Do we have people who, who are already naturally entering into this world? So I think there are a lot of interesting questions to do, think about. Your country is the most interesting use case. Uh, I'm, really, I'm really looking forward to continuing uh, cooperation with you. Uh, Anja, an AI-based system in the military domain does not become smarter or become more stupid if it crosses a border. There is an international perspective. Um, can you say something about the international discussion, especially based on your experience in Geneva? Um, sure. Um, so, in case you're not familiar with the process in Geneva, there is this convention on certain conventional weapons, the CCW, um, where states have been coming together for quite a few years now to discuss the issue of lethal autonomous weapons systems. They started in 2014, and then they uh, introduced a group of governmental experts at GGE in 2017. Um, and in the end, there might be some form of regulation of autonomous weapons systems. I'm, not even saying a prohibition anymore, but there could be some um, uh, rule of humanitarian arms control in the end of this process. In 2019, states um, um, came up with a set of guiding principles, and um, so that was kind of a highlight of this process, but in, since 2021, I would say this whole thing became, came into very heavy waters um, because states couldn't find a, or couldn't, 
find a consensus uh, for a final report in that year. And uh, in last year, uh, Russia blocked uh, the formal opening of the GGE meetings for a couple of days um, for, well, interesting reasons. Um, never mind, um, that means that the talks were in, on an informal level, and so all the things that has been discussed there couldn't become part of the formal report. So the final report there is very, very slim, and so we don't see much progress on that level in the CCW. Um, I th say this because to you know, give you the, the context that um, I don't have very high hopes for that particular process, but um, being the eternal optimist, there are also some, some things we could salvage from this and that could become interesting also for the FCAS development. Um, we do have this set of guiding principles that include um, kind of um, yeah, buzzwords <laughs> uh, like responsible, responsibility, accountability, and the human-machine interaction um, at the center of all this. We also have several working papers of uh, larger groups of states uh, who came up with various uh, ideas how to approach uh, this and how to operationalize these terms. And they do have, at least in some themes, um, quite an overlap, actually. So there is progress going on on that level, I would say. Of course, we first have the link of human involvement and the compliance to IHL. Um, we have the, the frame that the human and the human role is really at the center of any regulation and of approaching these weapon systems and not technological solutions. I think that's important. It's not, it doesn't have AI, general, AI, narrow, what have you. It's about the human there and the human role and the question what is the human ethically and legally obliged to do in any case. Um, we have this notion that human control or whatever you want to call it is a combination of design and use. So it's control by design and control in use. Um, and we have the, the idea of the life cycle as well that comes in there, starting really early to um, checking what the human role is in the development and then later use of the weapon system. Another theme is the context dependence of human control. So it's not a one size fits all solution. It really depends on how the system is shaped, but also where it is used in which scenario um, how, uh, which defines how human control has to look like in the end to comply with IHL rules. And that means that in the end, with all this context dependency and all that, we re might, if there is any norm, we will see a very broad norm probably. So if the CCW comes to a conclusion at some point, it will probably be more of a framework norm, if you like, and then there will be, uh, it will be necessary to have uh, national documents on this. Some states started with this, others didn't. Um, we, but we also need a regional um, or other groups to come up with, um, to operationalize this, for example, in NATO to, uh, to keep interoperationability. For FCAS, that means there isn't a regulation yet, but it's definitely important to look at the international level, see where this is going, look at the CCW, but also other processes like IEEE, for example, or what's going on at NATO. Um, so they are um, to yeah, get an idea how to translate this and, of course, to translate all these human control ideas into the specific scenarios um, that FCAS is meant to be used in or the use cases or applications. Um, because, as I said, it's not just a design question, it's also a use question. Um, and that, of course, should include France and Spain. Um, and like we discussed these uh, little scenarios in the ethical demonstrator you saw, but it's very important to have this discussion on an international level, of course, especially with the FCAS um, partners. So just one, one more point, as you saw, this ethical demonstrator, it's always important to keep in mind that it's a very small design discussion. So, of course, you know, control by design, every button counts, yeah, how do you design these buttons? It's not ethically neutral. But, of course, you also have to see the larger picture and part of the larger uh, order loop, if you like. Um, so that is really just a very, very simplified version and by no means will solve the issue of human control. Thanks. And yeah, you are certainly right. M mountain climbing means making small steps, but many small steps uh, to, to climb the summit, of course. Um, um, we didn't talk yet about the price tag of responsible AI. Can we afford responsible AI? We are living in a world where uh, the enemy, obviously, as we see it daily in the news, um, is, is not taking care of any, any ethical, um, ethical considerations. Um, 
we in Germany, the, the post-war uh, German Armed Forces, the Bundeswehr, ha has a concept of the citizen in uniform. But also sol soldiers and policemen, have, do they have something in co common, General Falmer? The policemen are protecting the order of, of, of a state on the civil level. They uh, have to, to capture uh, criminals who don't care about ethics, but they have to preserve law and order. Is there an analogy between a policeman and a soldier, General Vollmer? The analogy is that we are all rooted in, in, in our laws and in ethics and morale as well. But the law is binding, it, be it international law, be it uh, the law of, uh, of, of warfare. So there are cl a clear setting of rules. And uh, the armed forces after 1956 have been grown up in this setting of understanding. And the same goes for our, the, the way how we um, build up our forces within NATO. So we have a huge set of rules, regulations, code of conduct. And uh, the discussion we just had is um, we don't start from the scratch. For example, the whole process of targeting is so f fine ciseliert, so the, really depicted into the smallest details what has to be obeyed, what are the, 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 uh, the, the, the procedures to be followed, uh, what, what needs to be uh, achieved, and, and so on. So this is really something uh, very uh, detailed uh, already worked out. And it was more worked out in detail, of course, uh, with our engagement in Afghanistan, but we had a, a, an additional set of rules. The, the big challenge now is that we are facing war again, as we see it in the Ukraine, is, uh, is, 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 is to look into the set of rules again. But the basis is, 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 lo is, is the law. So there is no way out of it. And uh, so this is my answer. So. Uh, for me, it's, it's, it's in our genes, it's in our blood, and, and you don't step outward. What we have to take into consideration, I take your point, that our adversaries uh, are not uh, obeying these uh, rules of law as we see it with Russia in the Ukraine at the moment. So they are really not uh, accepting any of these rules. They are just uh, pushing forward in a way which is, uh, for us, unthinkable. Uh, so therefore, my point is, we don't start from the scratch with all this discussion of what needs to be implemented. Mm -hmm. what we, we have a set of rules, and that needs to be taken care of uh, in the development of uh, how to integrate AI in this FCAS project. Uh, but uh, the starting point is, is well defined. So this is nothing new. Mm -hmm. um, um, military efficiency, tech, tech, technological excellence, and, uh, and ethical requirements are these contradictory uh, to each other or not? Is perhaps the, uh, Tom, perhaps is the, is the um, technical excellence, perhaps in addition with, with an ethical alignment, perhaps more effective on the battlefield than just brutality? I mean, it's definitely a complementary effort that we need to take. While I, on one hand side have, of course, always race in technology, how to do things quicker, better, faster. I think the debate we are here in is not about how to do things faster, it's about how to find our own way of how to deal with that kind of technology. Uh, so elaborating on this discussion is, is, is a different viewing angle. So that's why on one hand side as an engineer, of course I like to talk about uh, competitive development, but with that kind of discussion it is totally separate discussion point for me mm -hmm. uh, to, to really, how do I use it? How do I, as a person, as a human, be human being, make myself comfortable with it? Uh, how do I have my customer being comfortable with it? And how do we as a society feel comfortable with using it? So it's not the decision of a singular person. It's not uh, the decision of, uh, um, of, a, of a single body. It's really a multi-stakeholder approach. Uh, how can we feel in that community that we are using those kind of systems comfortable with using that kind of technology? Mm -hmm. So therefore, it's for me a fully complementary discussion uh, that happens between technological development and ethical implementation, which hopefully will, will give us the, uh, we may call it competitive edge or whatever, uh, but at least the appropriate solution to deal with the topic. 
Kairi, the Estonian armed forces have a quite different um, tradition and history uh, compared to the German armed forces. Um, uh, what do you think from, from your, the Estonian perspective? Was it, was it easy to become um, a, a part of the NATO alliance? Um, uh, is your military thinking quite in line with what, uh, what uh, General Vollmer just said? Is there um, a, a, a unity in mind and heart? Uh, there is unity, but uh, it's uh, again we are coming back to the resources and, and the mindset uh, uh, that uh, <clears throat> how, how much we can afford the, the developments and the research and development uh, projects uh, compared with uh, acquisition of uh, conventional capabilities. So it's always like um, like on the scale or, or question of balance. Uh, and and when I when we did our study uh, about ethical aspects of autonomous systems and, and what our military think uh, about uh, autonomy and AI in defense forces and their opportunities of them. So it, it clearly, they clearly brought, brought out that uh, it's a very nice thing and, and uh, we need this kind of uh, technology, but, uh, but this is a question of how much we can afford and what, what is, uh, is uh, resource-wise uh, uh, the resource-wise thinking was clearly there, but uh, and and uh, what was even more interesting is that uh, uh, that uh, they supported uh, uh, the different kinds of uh, technologies and and uh, uh, and uh, but but the ethical questions and and the legal questions I think it needs a bit more elaboration and a bit, bit more. Uh, talking about it and discussing about it. A founding element of our working group for responsible design for FCAS is transparency and, and involvement of all the reasonable public, um, public forces. And actually it's the same as the REAIM summit, very small of course. Therefore I would like to open the discussion um, to, to the audience. It's very important I believe to, to come into um, a discussion um, with you and to, uh, to listen very careful to, to what you are saying and what you have to say in order to, to come to a consensus. Oh, many questions, I'm happy. Thank you very much. My name is Mark Bracco. I work for the Future of Life Institute, which is a non-profit that works on AI governance. Uh, I'm a big fan of FCAS and the sort of ethical approach that you take in designing uh, the project. Um, and there's also many NATO states and countries that have recently updated or developed their policies on autonomy. It's the United States, 3009. Uh, the Norwegians, the Netherlands has its new position on autonomy and weapon systems. Um, but there's a major player in the FCAS project, which is Germany, um, which doesn't. Um, and given how much money the German army will have soon to invest, I'm wondering, and I guess this is a question to Ms. Dahlmann and to General Vollmer, do you see a perspective towards a German national position on autonomy and weapon systems? And if so, on what timeline would that happen? Do you like to start? <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I love this question. Thank uh, you. I, I take it it's fair. <laughs> First of all, I think the, the point has been made earlier by Mr. Singer, uh, by Tassilo. This AI, and as it, as it has been discussed during this conference yesterday, uh, puts everything in, 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 into one big bag, and, and that is dangerous. So if you talk about AI, we have to look at, are we talking about decision support uh, instruments uh, like we have it here with uh, AI? It's a use case, very specifically. Or are we talking about uh, semi-autonomous weapons or even autonomous weapons? Concerning autonomous weapons, uh, th this is something very special, and that is something uh, which, from my perspective, as I understand it, uh, is not foreseen in the German armed forces. So this is a no-go, uh, uh, autonomous weapons. So that is something we will not have a look into it. What we have a look at into is uh, how can we use uh, the, the algorithms to help us uh, to, 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 to in this decision-making process or preparing for a decision. This is with semi-autonomous uh, weapons. That is uh, with the FCAS project as well, where, where you have uh, one airplane and the, the wingmen are then uh, may, maybe uh, drones. So this is something, but it's always the human still in the loop in this whole process. And, and that is uh, the, the, the underlining um, 
point uh, in, in the German armed forces. Nobody is looking at autonomous weapons. Everybody is looking at how can technology help us to achieve our, uh, our tasks. So this is uh, my, my view on it. And I understand, know, and, and, and uh, Dr. Koch can elaborate on it uh, much better, that even industry is now writing a white paper on how to understand how to this, this ethical aspects just from the beginning. So away this, I push aside this autonomous issue. I'm, I'm looking into AI as in, in certain use cases, how to help us. And, and now the floor goes to you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Right, uh, thanks for this question. Uh, and it's a point I have been raising like <laughs> for years now <laughs> that Germany should come up with something. Because for now, at the moment, we have several coalition treaties where you know, the parties mention that we don't want fully autonomous weapon systems or in other terms, but basically that. Um, we have a few statements at the CCW uh, and we have an AI strategy that says, well, with all the military, or the, the, the armed forces will deal with all the military questions. We don't answer them here. Well, that is definitely not enough. And as we can see with uh, France having um, this ethical committee there with the US and others, it's definitely possible to have such, an, um, docu to such, have such a document. And it's important uh, also as a point of reference and something you can discuss. And we can't do this in Germany on that level. So we need kind of a strat strategic document there. But I don't know what the timeline is. Uh, as far as I have heard, there isn't much going on on that regard, but keep pushing for it, please. <laughs> um, Wolfgang? May I ask a question? Uh, Thank you to the panel. I have a question, especially to the general. Yeah. Yeah, as I see at the moment, no military will declare which, uh, what weapon system is AI enabling or not. So, when you talked about AI must be con uh, following the rule of uh, humanitarian law. That's good. But uh, if, say, an AI system put into battlefield, maybe it will not accept a surrender of the enemy soldiers. And the, the one side who deployed the system would say, oh, I don't know whether they are real surrender or a fake surrender. And if you say, ask a question, whether the enemy can surrender to a ICBM or to a, a 155 millimeter howitzer uh, artillery uh, warheads, is that the, the problem? So when nobody say whether my weapon system is AI enabling or not, how could these principles be conducted during the war or just after the war? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, very tough question. Um, it goes back to my, my point, we always have to make sure that the humans are making the decisions. It is not a machine. I will never take orders from a machine, to put it this way, uh, very bluntly. Uh, so therefore, th it is important that we understand technology has developed. I don't think that uh, I, I, as it was discussed yesterday, and uh, the panelists, I should, they, they agreed as well, is something revolutionary in, in, in military art or so. It is something, uh, a development, uh, which can help us to become better, faster, and so on. But in the end, it's always the human who has to make the decision. And you have to be on the ground. You have to, to witness what's ongoing. It, I, I always said to my soldiers, I have to go to, to all the places where they were uh, distributed. I have to smell it. I have to feel it. I have to see it. If you don't are in the situation, you don't have a proper assessment. And in the end, you might take the wrong decision. I also have the deep understanding that uh, that AI, artificial intelligence, will blur the battlefield. Definitely not. It will not provide a huge screwdriver then from our capitals uh, to, to intervene in decisions on the ground, in the air, or in the, in, in the, in, in the uh, maritime domain, or not cyber and space as well. So there's always a, a clear chain of command, and, uh, and you are given the means, uh, and, and you have to fulfill the task. 
and uh, you will stick into your set of rules and, and you will fulfill your mission. You will use technology to help you, but not hand it over to the uh, machine or to, to technical solutions to do the decision for you. That is something we have to avoid and that is something we have to address very clearly. What can help us is fine, but in the end it's you, the human, who has to make a decision. You may, may like it or you may not like it, but you have to do it. Uh, you are given the authority and please, not please, you have to act like that. So this is my answer to it. Yeah? it thank you. Hi, uh, Matthias Klaus, Cup Gemini. I would like to pick up the question concerning if we can afford to follow responsible AI. And I would like to highlight the uh, US uh, DOD approach with their responsible AI implementation pathway, which actually argues it's not a disadvantage, it's an advantage. Um, because they say, and I know some people might be surprised by it, but um, they say it's uh, developing skills for the individual working with the AI. And there might be instances where the accelerated OODA loop puts us at a disadvantage against ruthless opponents abusing AI, but overall in the long run, because of de-skilling, automation bias, etc., um, responsible AI will be an advantage on giving us an edge because we will not be exploited as easily as somebody trusting in a completely or fully automated um, decision loop. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Hmm. We'll uh, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I tend to agree um, because I think this kind of narrative or frame that less human control, which is kind of implied in, re no, right? Uh, that less human control equals a military advantage, that's just, I don't see that it's true because tying it back to the CCW debate, um, the intent is not to create or to invent new rules, as to how, as a question, how do we bring the existing rules, or how do we combine existing rules to new technological circumstances and new military options that we have. So um, meaningful human control there is just a tool to operationalize this, right? So yeah, we still, we still need this, and it's still an advantage. And as states who still want to live in a rule-based world order, we shouldn't incentivize <coughs> like having disproportionate attacks or, or, or things like that, or attacking civilians or violating human dignity. So it's just important to, to keep this up and to find solutions and maybe also to draw red lines where we're going to want to go and where we don't. But yeah, I think it's an advantage. In Asilo, I, I think you might, you might have something to add. Yes, um, and it uh, connects again to your demonstrator. Um, well, if we have certain requirements coming out of a responsible AI concept, the requirements force you to develop the technology more thoroughly and to get into deeper into the technology. So you all saw the, the heat map pictures and most of you probably saw, thought like, oh yeah, this is a little bit blurred, is this sufficient? So this is exactly the point. We then have to develop the technology that gives us more precise uh, information. If I don't care about these issues, I'm not doing this more precisely. So this is also, you know, it's a two-sided thing. You have a chance by this. So now we have to develop more XAI, explainable AI, more tools to understand what is happening. And this gives us more information about how it is working, where are the deficiencies, and so on. And just, just break uh, the, or build the bridge to operational thing. Well, as a commander, as a decision maker, by, by these explainable additional tools, I get more situational awareness, which means I have more information on the table, which I normally wouldn't have if I have a fully automated, non-transparent system. So there is a clear operational advantage in it. But still, of course, you have to always look at the single use case and on the requirement you're imposing and to align those interests, operational, legal, ethical, and the technical side. And maybe that was a perfect handover point yeah. to me. Uh, <laughs> Wasn't planned. Because I think if I really do that requirements capture at the beginning, I mean, it's really giving me the advantage. It's better I have considered that appropriately from the early stages. Instead, I get that topic put on my plate right at the end when I already have developed solutions. Then redesigning is much more expensive than really doing it right properly. I mean, first time right is an expression that I actually don't like, but. Uh, first time properly considered in the development cycle, I might rather phrase it, uh, then that's the appropriate way how to deal with it. 
Uh, Maaike Verbrugge, Vrij Nieuwsheid, Brussels. I, I was wondering, you talked about the problems, you know, translating vague requirements like responsible AI into technical requirements. So coming from academia myself, what would be useful for you? What sort of guidelines, documents, metrics would be helpful for you to, to deal with, with these issues um, from, from our side, from a policy side? I mean, there are different topics. The, the one is, of course, uh, having kind of checklist type procedures that basically allow me, okay, if you go through that and if you have tick marked those things and I'm coming from a flightist environment, so I like checklists. Um, so, so from that part, this is of course helpful for an engineer because it's given an, an, an easy rule set uh, to go along with. The other one is really having tangible discussions. So on one hand side, theoretical foundation, but really being tangent, tangible on the precise problem that needs to be solved. And for those specific problem statements, have identified where are the key points that need to be reflected on. Certainly the general would read your paper as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my, my point is, um, we are always working in, in a legal frame. This is uh, the, the, the conditio sine qua non. So this is a legal frame. What we need, and, and this is what we are asking for, is uh, to have this permanent discussion as it is done during this uh, summit here today and yesterday, uh, really to explain w what are we doing. Uh, this is what we are thinking about. Uh, is this uh, still in, in your understanding of our legal box? So this is this, this continuous conversation which is needed and this understanding. Doesn't mean that we always had and share the same point. However, this allows then to, 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 to get a better understanding. It is definitely not in our developments uh, that uh, is, is pushing legal constraints. No, no way. It is just to understand what they are, and we need to have this continuous process uh, of, of uh, uh, discussion and understanding. And from my point of view, uh, I think uh, the control of what the military or the industry is developing for the military is under much larger constraints what we see in the civil world. So this is the danger we face from time to time, that now we have some developments in, on the civilian side which now have a spillover effect into military. And that is, uh, again, this point where we need to understand, oops, this is something which has been far developed uh, in, in the civilian domain, and that is something we don't want to have uh, in, in, in the military domain. So the, the, the good news is uh, military is very well under control in our democracies. I'm talking about our democracies. It will be or is different in other states, uh, no doubt about it. But in our democracies, I feel very comfortable uh, that we have this uh, system. But the, the interesting point is uh, things uh, developed on the civilian side with a lot more freedom, the famous Silicon Valley and others, is spilling over from time to time. And we have to avoid that we grab it and say, hey, this is cool. Uh, this helps me as well. That there, there might be legal constraints to it not to do it. So conversation, open-minded, uh, with no uh, hurdles uh, to be built up, uh, this is uh, necessary. Another question. So I'm uh, Leon Kuster from uh, Netherlands, from TNO. Uh, very interesting uh, uh, approach, I would say. So um, I have uh, one question I have is that uh, in many, I'm in many different domains, in the military domain, but also in the uh, European Union, trying to exercise the AI Act and what also uh, regulations should be uh, around the AI Act. And what I, uh, both in the military domain and in the civil domain, what I see is that we often talk about artificial intelligence, but there, there's not often made a distinction between the AI system itself and the, and the algorithms in there and the objective <coughs> function of exactly. the uh, system. And I think this is very important to make this distinction because I think there's also different responsibilities to implementing what should be in the objective function of AI systems and then companies or everybody could then think about how to optimize on those objective functions. But it's very important, I think, to realize that the, what is in the objective functions should also be a multi-stakeholder problem. And I'm a little bit worried, actually, that when I talk to uh, lawyers and legislators in the European Union, mm -hmm. and, I, and I mention, okay, how do you think about objective functions and, and how they come about, 
that they actually <laughs> don't know what an objective function is. So I think this is very important to realize that. Leon, this is a very perfect closing remark, I must say. Um, I would like to close the sessions. I think there are two, two major, major lessons learned. First of all, we have to distinguish between very, very different and specific use cases of AI. This is one important thing. And the other important thing is AI has to be anthropocentric. It has to be... Um, it must fit to the, to the human being. It must be a, a something in the hand of somebody, a person. And this closes this most interesting um, panel, and I learned a lot, I must say. Thank you. Oh, thank you.